Welcome back. Long time no see. Sorry for that. Just been really busy with other things. Welcome to a door cream. Now we're going to talk about the second of my around the world in the day videos. The first one was kind of sort of the whole priming video, the one that was the fallout, which was about everything that happened between um, Purple Rain and Around the World in the day. Now we've established that, I just want to establish one thing. I mentioned that, you know, Prince's behaviour was a bit, you know, he got pilloried by the media. And actually, I think some people got it misconstrued that I was condemning Prince for acting that way. I actually wasn't. I felt that Prince was not, I mean, okay, he wasn't an angel, but he wasn't acting any different to her, any standard pop star who just newly arrived to this titanic level of fame would have would basically um, deal with such so much fame so quickly. I mean, Prince had had fame before, but Purple Rain just blew him into the stratosphere and basically made him the most visible person in the in the world for a short time. I mean, pretty much you could call it the Donald Trump effect, I guess, although Prince wasn't an arsehole like Donald Trump. Now, um, today we're going to talk about the production of Around the World in a Day because it was much more basic and quicker than all the earlier albums, and we're also going to talk about the promotion and the singles released of it. Okay, when I say singles released, I mean like I'm going to talk about the singles and their release and their success, but... I am not actually going to review any songs or any music until the next video, so basically this will be the analytical one again. I'm going to show a few bits and pieces from Billboard because when Around the World in the Day came out, people were really anticipating it. People were expecting such big things because, you know, Purple Rain had been such a massive hit, you know, and I mean, um, generally, I mean, all us Hardcore Prince fans knew this album was brilliant, but it just was not Purple Rain Part 2. So first of all, Let's talk about the album Around the World in a Day. Okay, the name, the term comes from basically the old Jules Verne novel. I think it was Around the World in 80 Days. Around the World in a Day was basically because at the time when Purple Rain was just coming out and being released, Prince was starting to experiment with more open-minded um, forms of music beyond straight ahead R&B and rock. I mean, as you know, Purple Rain is very much what we consider a rock album. There's a lot of rock guitar on it, basically. I mean, Let's Go Crazy and Purple Rain, it's all guitars, basically. And, of course, there's a bit of princely funk thrown in, but Around in the World in a Day is just such a different beast altogether. It's definitely more sort of world music, psychedelic pop, feel-good pop, piano ballads, and some good old lusty Prince sex thrown in for good measure. It's definitely, in a lot of ways, it's a much more adventurous album than Purple Rain. I think that, sadly, because a lot of the people who just liked straight-ahead pop and rock music bought Purple Rain, and they thought, wow, Prince is the next Bruce Springsteen or Billy Joel or something, and he turned out to be anything but that. He kind of was like the next um, Terence Trent Derby before we had a Terence Trent Derby, and he proved that he was definitely more, you know, more solid than your standard pop star like Michael Jackson or Madonna. I mean, Prince proved that he was adventurous. Part of this newfound adventure was the people Prince was hanging around with. Starting in 84, I mean, Prince had already brought Lisa and Wendy into the band, and they were introducing them to a lot of white pop references, and also groups like the Beatles and the Turtles and um, Jimi Hendrix and Monkeys, a lot of 60s music, and also... Then you had um, guys like Atlanta Bliss and um, Eric Leeds who were basically bringing in the sort of, you know, sort of jazz background, I mean, and Prince was, I mean, okay, not quite Miles Davis jazz, but definitely sort of more modern stuff like Chuck Mangio, and, and Prince was looking at these more influences. And also Lisa Coleman had a brother called David, and um, basically David really loved to play world instruments like dabukas and finger cymbals and um, sitars and things, and um, Prince heard this guy, you know, trashing around all these weird instruments at sunset style one day and thought, hey, I wonder what some of that stuff would sound like on my next record. So Prince found out that David was turning 21 and Prince gave him a day's free, you know, studio work at Sunset Sound. You know, on him, you know, jump in the studio, do whatever you want all day, I'll pay for it. Because especially for an unknown musician, I mean, studios are expensive. I mean, I think when you look at um, Toodle's book, I mean, it was something like 90 bucks an hour just to basically use a studio. And like Prince was paying, you know, several thousand dollars just to tape every song of Purple Rain. So this was a significant present. David went in there, he bought all his finger bells, his dabukas, cowbells, cymbals, sitars, you know, um, uds, you name it. And he made a whole lot of noise, and Prince took some of that noise and stuck it on to the first track of his um, song, Around the World in a Day. And, you know, the, when the song opens, you hear that, all those um, beautiful instruments, I mean, I absolutely love it, I think it's really adventurous. That's all David Coleman, basically, and of course, um, at this stage, David Coleman didn't realise he was unofficially contributing to a Prince song. And, of course, Prince recorded the rest in August 1984, so... That's how the thing started. I mean, when you listen to Around the World in a Day, I mean, you listen to it with different ears and you listen to, say, Purple Rain or even 1999. It's got a world, more sort of world music, earthy pop sound. I mean, it's definitely Prince's most adventurous album. I wouldn't go so far to call it psychedelic because Prince wasn't on drugs when he was doing it or anything, and I don't think that. I love, there's a lot of psychedelic music I absolutely love, and like Pink Floyd and stuff, and I don't just think it's all drugs, you know. I think it's just the melodic textures of some of this type of music, you know, just it's amazing, so... Basically, nine tracks on um, Around the World in a Day. For those of you who don't know, basically, I'm going to say them in the order they were taped. The first song to go on the album was um, basically 
pop life. Now Prince taped this song way back in February 84. This was at the same time he was still finishing off mixes of I Would Die For You. And before he wrote When Doves Cry. So, so pop life realistically, I mean it's the one song on the album that sounds like you could have stuck it on Purple Rain. It still has a very sort of pop feel to it. You know, but it's still it's a br brilliant song. I mean it's a parable about, you know, what are you putting up your nose. It's about the sudden, you know, pressures of fame. And I think Prince was bracing himself for it in a lot of ways. Um, and then there's nothing more basically until um, July 84 when Prince and the band taped America. This was at the same time when Purple Rain was just exploding everywhere. Now August 84 was when Prince finished off Around the World in a Day. It's when he put his parts like, you know, Around the World in a Day. And he goes, Somebody, I think I want to dance. And Ow! That part was all added then. Um, and then September 1984 was a very, very productive time. Prince put three more songs onto the album then. Um, Paisley Park was taped, Raspberry Beret and um, Tambourine all went on in September 84. At this time, remember, I mean, Prince wasn't doing any shows. You know, the Purple Rain was still doing the rounds. He was in the studio basically working on this album. And he was getting everything ready before the Purple Rain tour kicked off. In October, two more songs came out, Condition of the Heart and um, The Ladder were taped at that time. And that explains why all these songs were pretty much you'd hear him playing bits and pieces of them on the Purple Rain tour. Already when those of you going to later Purple Rain shows, I mean already the feel was changing from the straight ahead rock and pop of Purple Rain into the more adventurous stuff you hear on Around the World in a Day. Okay, and then we get to December 84, halfway through the tour, I think when he had some days off in Minneapolis, or it might have even been in LA, um, Prince went into the studio. I think this might have been at the Flying Cloud Warehouse and because Prince did the Christmas shows at St. Paul and then he didn't resume the tour until the middle of January 85. And then um, basically he would have taped the song Temptation. So that's the songs. Now, um, some of the B-sides were even earlier. I mean, as you know, She's Always In My Hair. I mean, that is an absolutely incredible song. That song was actually taped sometime in December of 1983, not long after We Can Fuck and Erotic City were taped. So really brilliant time then. And um, I think also too, um, uh, no, Hello was taped much, much later. It was taped about February, March 85, actually. I mean, it was at the time, you know, when I talk about the Fallout video. And of course, for the tears in your eyes, also dates from that time of that. It doesn't appear on any Around the World in the Day themed release. And Girl also dates from um, sometime in mid 84. Okay, so moving right along. Um, so that was the album. Basically, um, the album was in the can and ready to go basically by January 85. He took it to Warner's. Warner said, Yeah, this is, you know, we, don't, we, want, to, we want to just push out Purple Rain a bit more. But um, so what happened was Prince kept touring Purple Rain. I think it was um, early February 1985, I think everybody's heard this story, basically Prince, Wendy and Lisa and his father John L. Nelson showed up at the Warner Brothers Burbank Studios or some bloody thing, and they were all wearing these captains, they jumped out of a limousine, people were throwing rose petals around them, and they went into a room which was decorated with like cushions and captains and all this hippie shit. They sat down and basically they played a mix of Around the World in the Day, the whole album. And the Warner's executives who were expecting basically to hear Purple Rain Part 2 were quite shocked because all that, especially when they heard the beginning of the first track with all those um, exotic instruments in it. And apparently one of, the, one of the books I read, the first things was that nobody actually heard anything resembling a pop hit until Raspberry Beret came on. And people were like, oh no, Prince has gone bizarre again. And then Prince dropped the clangor after that basically. He said, um... Uh, and Warner said, oh, great, great, we, you know, we can get this on, we can get this out, you know, we can promote this shit, you know, Prince, you're a big star, Purple Rain sold 10 billion copies, we're going to get this out, we could, this is going to be a huge hit, you know, we're going to put Raspberry Beret out as the first single, and then Prince turned around and said, no, I don't want any singles, I'm sick of this rampant commercialism, I want to release this album the way with the fans find the music, and I mean, already Warner's thought, okay, we've got a crazy on our hands here, we want to make some money already, you know, and, and Prince wants to start this, you know, sort of communist hippie love commune nonsense, basically. And then Prince got real angry about it. And for two whole months, he was the stalemate, basically. The album hadn't come out. Prince was still touring Purple Rain. And by this stage, he was completely and utterly sick of it. You may have noticed I've toned down on the swearing now because um, I've turned the fence as far as swearing goes. I mean, now I'm a Christian. I don't like using that foul language anymore. So you want to hear me curse and swear, go back to all my earlier videos, basically. Um, so... This was a stalemate that lasted for a while, and basically, um, this is the end of the first part. We'll um, chop it off here, and I'll show some pictures, and I'll come back to you.
Okay, we are back. I hope you like those little pictures there. Um, so where we'd left it was that February, March 85, Prince had decided that he wasn't going to promote any singles, which was in 1985 practically suicidal. I mean, if you want to sell an album, you need to promote some singles. But anyway, what Prince did do was finally in late April, um, the album itself came out. It came out on April 22nd, 1985. And you just saw about the Billboard stuff. There was a lot of anticipation. And when the album popped out, some people liked it, some hated it. I think at the start, people, a lot of people were just being polite because they thought, well, this is Prince. He gave us Purple Rain. This guy can't do any wrong. Maybe he's giving us a deeper vision we all have to try and understand. And anyway, there was nothing that had been released as a single. But finally, halfway through May, even though the album shot straight to number one and went double platinum, they knew they could be doing more. So finally, in early May 1985, Prince said, OK, just choose something on the album and put it out as a single. Instantly, they chose Raspberry Beret because they knew it was by far the most obvious pop hit on the album. And sure enough, on the 15th of, of May 1985, Raspberry Beret was pretty much given a global release. And what you saw was this cover here. This is a 12 inch, but the 7 inch was very similar, except it was smaller. And those of you who have seen the cover illustration from the album realize that these are close up pictures of it. So if you actually turn it around, you'll actually see it's the bottom part of the woman and the dog. And the other cool thing about these singles is what you'll notice is these covers they use for them are really colourful. So this is what the Raspberry Beret symbol looks like. I mean, you look at this paisley writing, isn't it? Just groovy. And on the back, all the B-sides have this style of um, thing. Now, Pace, our Raspberry Beret was the first song, and it was a massive hit. It got to number two on the charts. Sadly, though, it was not a number one hit. They were expecting a number one hit, and they didn't get it. So Prince was actually slightly disappointed. I think there was probably some Phil Collins song or some mid 1980s synthesized nonsense that was keeping it off the top of the charts who knows um it only got to number three on the black chart which was even worse which showed that prince was starting to lose that black audience and um it didn't it did it got pretty much to number two or number three around most places in the world the english who were very slow to pick up on prince it only got to number five over there and um so that was but then what was even stranger was that in britain australia and parts of europe Paisley Park was released as the first single because like Prince said, he just said, go ahead and release what you think is going to sell. Now, We Are Division over in Europe, they decided that um, Raspberry Beret wasn't going to be the first hit, so they put out Paisley Park as the first single. And they'd even had a video with a famous video which shows um, the people playing at the playground, pushing the swings up and down. Prince is nowhere to be seen in it. And um, Paisley Park was not much of a hit. It only got to basically number 18 in the UK and number 42 in um Australia and only got basically into the top 40 basically it was something about as well as a Boney M single pretty much and it wasn't really a hit so basically they all jumped on the bag wagon and put out Raspberry Beret which promptly became a top 10 hit everywhere now just going back to Raspberry Beret also what sold it was this absolutely wonderful video that was taped on the sound stage it shows Prince and the whole band along with um, a guy called Eddie M playing the saxophone I mean Eddie M Eddie, Eddie Minifield who basically joined Sheila E's band was this absolutely amazing saxophone player and you hear his saxophone throughout around the one day. I'll talk about him more in the review of the music. And that's a great video where Prince is wearing this like cloud suit and it's sort of blending in with this ground. It's part sort of live concert and other parts showing cartoons of them having sex in the footage. And so for some reason Prince has magically turned into a white man, which I find weird considering he's black. But anyway, I think that was possibly this mid 80s, you know, the whiter we look, the whiter we sound, the more records will sell mentality. And again, probably why the blacks were going off Prince in a huge way. And Prince would actually continue to hemorrhage black fans right up until the start of the 90s when he went all hip hop and black on us. This was definitely Prince entering a sort of more white poppy phase. And that's why a lot of us, especially, I really want to hear some feedback from some African American and black people, basically, just what they think of this music in this era. Did they, were they going off Prince? I mean, did they, did they not like this part of Prince's career as much as, say, the period up to and including Purple Rain and then the 90s onwards? Because, I mean, I could say generally as a white or almost white man that I absolutely love this period. I love all the periods, but this period really speaks out to me. I mean, Around the World in a Day was always an album I wrote off for a long time. But a few years ago, I just sat down and listened to it again and actually realized it's just brilliant. I mean, it's just so quirky. There's just so much of a vision he's trying to project in this album. He's trying to do everything in this album. It's so much more adventurous than Purple. It's not as good as Purple Rain, but it's more adventurous. And I think it was the beginning of a new direction. I mean, she really took to much better extremes with Farm Parade and sign of the times i mean parade is definitely an extension of around the world in the day and it's just incredible basically i mean this is still a good album though. i mean there's still some amazing stuff i mean raspberry Ray, yes it's a pop single but it's also one of the finest pop singles he's ever written i mean it's genius there's no other way to describe it you know so i mean this was a massive hit even though it only got to number two it was still a huge huge hit and then what happened was 
They were keeping the singles coming out thick and fast because Prince was not touring this album. He had just finished the Purple Rain thing and he had announced, you know, his live retirement, which was even more bizarre. The second single to come out was Pop Life and this came out in July of 1985 at a time when Raspberry Beret was still in the charts. And again, this is another close-up of the lady crying, basically. And then um, you hear it and think there's a lady crying by the seesaw. So again, you've got this psychedelic heart. And once again, for you, I can show you what the actual single itself looked like. And the design was the same on the 7 inches. 12 inches, see, they've changed the colour font to green. And on the back, again, the same thing. Basically, hello. It's got those clouds. And then, um, of course, in the Raspberry Bray video, the famous part about it is the coughing. Um, the Pop Life video isn't as great. It's mainly got turnstiles and more of the sort of playground thing. Um, but still, Pop Life is an amazing song. Again, it's very poppy. I mean, it's easy to see why it was released as a second single. It was a big hit. Not as big as Raspberry Bray. Only got to number seven in the charts. I think by this stage, already people were getting a bit tired of Prince. I mean, this was like, but still, this was like his um, eighth top ten hit in a row. I mean, apart from the flop of... Um, take me with you but still eight top ten hits in the space of two years it got to number seven on the white chart got to number eight on the black chart and it was a top 20 hit around most places of the world it was a fairly large hit basically but at the same time um, a song was released by a group called ready for the world called old Sheila which people thought was a Prince song but it was actually a Prince knockoff and that got all the way up to number one which was a bit of a pity the third single to come off the thing was America Coupled with Girl, this came, was released on the 19th of October 85, and unlike the first two singles, this our song was not a hit. It was a flop, basically. Okay, so this is what the cover looked like, showing the little black kid. I mean, they've actually airbrushed out his genitals, probably for obvious reasons. And again, you've got America in the um, red, white, and blue, which is quite interesting. And the record itself is even more interesting, as you can see. The psychedelic art shows the word America spelled out in red, white, and blue, basically. By the way, all these records are original. I bought them all back in the 2000s. They are not modern repressings. They all play really well. Okay, the covers are heavy card for the first two singles, but for America, it's this sort of cheap, flimsy vinyl that stuff they started using in 85, 86. All of them appear to be New Zealand or Australian pressings. Okay, that song was a flop. It only got to number 30, 46 on the American charts. It was only in the charts for about six weeks. And it was um, 35 was the uh, placing on the black chart. So actually slightly bigger hit on the black chart, but 35 don't mean nothing, basically. And after that, basically no more singles were released off um, around the world in a day. And of course, there was about a three or four month wait until Kiss was released to promote the new album. And as we all know, Kiss turned out to be Prince's biggest hit since Purple Rain. Okay, so that was it. Now we'll talk about the album, how well the album did. Okay, as I said, the album was released on April the 22nd, 1985. It instantly went platinum, then double platinum. It did spend three weeks at number one, but unlike Purple Rain, it did drop from the top ten quite quickly. It still remained a steady seller, remaining in the charts until the end of 1985. It launched up nearly 40 weeks on the charts. In the end, I mean, it got given a triple platinum um, certification sometime in the 90s. And around the world, it also sold around one and a half to two million copies in Europe. And it also got a platinum award in Britain for 100, I mean, sorry, a gold award for 100,000 copies sold. And did pretty well in Germany, the Netherlands, France, and um, also Australia and New Zealand. In um, the Netherlands, it got up to number one on the charts. It was the first time Prince really had massive success there. And Basically, that was the beginning of the Dutch love affair. I mean, I just love if there was a Dutch Prince fan, you could just get on and just say, why the Dutch? You guys just absolutely love Prince. I mean... Basically, the Dutch, the Germans, and the Danish are known to be the, like, the biggest Prince fans around, probably to the Swedish as well. I mean, his liberal sound just, I think, really appealed to them. And I mean, the Dutch people, they've always loved really funky music, you know, I guess. So they've got great taste, you know, the Dutch. But anyway, um, so, but the good thing too, what was kind of selling it to was that throughout 85, I mean, 1999 and Purple Rain were still in the charts as steady sellers. However, by the end of 1985, I think the world was suffering Prince burnout and um, basically all three albums dropped off the charts. And basically after 1985, his dominance in selling music really drops off. I mean, he's still having big hits, like he has a number one hit with Kiss and he has basically number two and number three hits if you got the look and sign of the times. But basically 1985 was really the end of this period of mass fame. I think um, around the world in the day put a lot of people off. Um, Basically, Prince would not have another number one hit album until Batman. And um, pretty much, I mean, this was the end of his massive fame. After 85, I mean, he was still a big star, you know, but he was not basically the greatest thing in the world like he was in 1984, I think. 
Sadly, what had come along was Madonna was absolutely smashing records with Like a Virgin, and then True Blue came out, and that was an even bigger hit. And then, of course, Bruce Springsteen's album kept selling. Um, then, of course, 85. The big sensation of 85, which really knocked all these people out of the water, it wasn't Michael Jackson. He wouldn't come back to 87. was this new singer called Whitney Houston. She had her first top three hit in the middle of 85, Will You Give Good Love? And then she did a song called um, Saving All My Love For You, which went to number one and was there for about six weeks, and it just went crazy. Then her next single, How Will I Know, was another number one hit, and then The Greatest Love of All was a further number one hit. And her album be sold 11 million copies. In 85, 86, Whitney Houston became like the biggest black star on the planet and blew Prince and Michael Jackson out of the water. She kept it going in 87, you know, but we could go on to a Whitney Houston discussion here, but her early music is just magnificent. It's easy to see why it was a smash hit. And even at the end of 85 too, this will really make you guys laugh, Lionel Richie came back with Dancing on the Ceiling. And then before that, he had another one-off hit with the song Say You, Say Me. And that was another smash hit. So basically, um, Prince was getting supplanted by these um, evergreens and these new artists. So that's basically um, production and promotion. And the next video, we're going to review it. And then after that, we're going to do our final of my classic series, which is a review of the Family Album. And I'm doing that last because that came out last. That came out in August of 1985, even though, like with this album, Prince was preparing it a lot earlier. So there you are. May you all live to see the dawn. And, you know, the reason why I'm leaning over like this is because it's just got really hot all of a sudden. Here we've gone from like 16 degrees in rain to 30 degrees in hot sun overnight. So there you are.